Welcome to season four of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to current topics in public health through engaging interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Johns Hopkins COVID-19 expert Gigi Granval about all things COVID testing, why there's higher demand for tests now, why there may be test kit shortages, and why more testing is key to slowing the spread of the disease. Let's listen. Gigi Granval, thanks so much for coming back to the program. Thank you so much for having me. So today I want to talk about testing, all things testing when it comes to COVID-19. And I guess I wanted to start with um, President Biden's vaccine mandates mean there's going to be a lot of testing, a lot more testing as people perhaps choose to go the testing route rather than the vaccination route. And I'm wondering um, what that means. Are there enough tests for everybody? Well, it's not even just the people who decide that they don't want to be vaccinated and will opt for the testing instead. Um, It's also um, there's a lot more support for school based testing. And so there's going to be testing of all kinds that are um, that's going to be ramped up. So, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a a big ramp up of testing Um, so far. It doesn't seem like there's any shortage of um, PCR tests uh, available and or possible. But the the other kind of test, the rapid test, the one that gives you results in uh, 20 minutes or so, that um, that has been in a little bit in short supply these days. Mm-hmm. And I guess that would be the type of thing I just saw, for example, that New York City is going to require everybody in schools to be tested weekly now. And that's the kind of test you would use in a school? You could do both. Um, some schools have elected to do PCR uh, testing. For example, Baltimore City um, does pooled testing. So that's PCR. And uh, they do that once a week for, for all of the city students. Um, other, other school systems have elected to um, invest in rapid tests, um, not just the ones that you can get at your uh, pharmacy if they're in stock, but ones that, that require a reader to be able to give you an answer. So a little bit more complicated tests. But um, schools have, have explored both options, and uh, it just is a matter of logistics. What are your concerns about uh, testing going forward? Uh, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot, there are a lot of issues with testing. I mean, there, there are a lot of different kinds of tests. And so I think it can be very confusing to people. Um, I think that there, there are um, sometimes a little bit um, too much faith put into testing because people think, oh, well, I'm good. Um, I got a negative test. And then they then they don't realize that you know that's just a moment in time. It's not it's not going to you know uh, give you an answer into the future. Um, so I think testing it requires a lot of explanation. And so um, you know there's you have to have the testing piece, and you have to also have an education piece, so people know why they're getting tested and and what the test results mean. Let's remind people sort of what the two major kinds of tests are and what their pros and cons are. Yes. So um, the two major kinds are molecular test. Most often people go for a PCR test and that's something that has to be done in a laboratory. Um, So it takes a little bit extra time to get your results. And that is very sensitive. So um, if you are just in the beginning stages of of being infected by SARS-CoV-2, this kind of test can theoretically pick up on that um, on the early stage. Of course, that doesn't mean you're going to get tested at that exact moment, but um, but it's possible that that it can detect even early cases. And then the other big kind of test that people get is a rapid test, a uh, rapid antigen test, and that uh, looks for the virus proteins that are in your nose at that moment. So people who are infectious um, will often be turned positive on that kind of test. 
The big difference between the two kinds of tests, well, there's several differences. One is the time that it takes to get results. Uh, the rapid tests, you know, that's they are rapid. They give you results in 20 minutes. Um, the other thing is, a, is the amplification step. So PCR can take these really tiny signals and, um, and detect them. Um, rapid tests, rapid antigen tests can't do that. On the other hand, do you really want to know if you have um, lingering genetic material from the virus weeks after you've had an, uh, an infection? No. Do you want to know if you have a lot of virus in your nose and you're breathing it out into the air? Yes, you do. So there are some pos positive uses for rapid antigen tests, um, even though it's not as super sensitive as PCR. And you'd take a, a rapid test if you're, if you're symptomatic. That's when it works the best, right? Correct. So often people who are symptomatic um, are in the, uh, the most you know, virus replication phase of, um, of their infection. And so there's going to, if you're infected with, uh, if you have COVID, you can have a lot of virus in your nose at that time. And, and so the test will work the best to detect it. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about uh, the home tests, which I think we've talked, we've touched on earlier, but now they're really uh, been out there for a while. I guess my question is, how accurate are they? Well, I mean, so there's there's controlled conditions for how they've tested the the tests, and um, and then there's what you do in your home, and um, and so what I recommend there's only three different kinds um, that are available right now. Hopefully, there'll be more in the coming weeks. Um, but you know, I recommend that people take a look at a YouTube video um, or the manufacturer's videos for how you do the test just to make sure that you're getting the right part of the nose and that you're that you're doing the test correctly. I think it, it helps to actually see it. The second time you do the test, it's super easy. But the first time, it might be a little bit easier to see somebody else doing it. And they are they have a very high correlation with PCR tests. So they can be very accurate. But, um, but you want to make sure that people are doing all the stuff correctly, um, as was done in the laboratory when they were testing these tests. So user error could be an issue. Uh, it's probably, I can't imagine sticking that way up in my nose. So <laughs> it's, it's not super high up. It's not, it's not the, the, what they call the brain swab sort of tests. It's, um, it's, it's a little bit more reasonable, but you know, you, they, each uh, test comes with two individual tests in there. And the idea is that you test once and then you test a couple of days later, according to the instructions, um, to see if there's uh, any change. But, you know, um, I suspect that people don't do that. So, um, so you, but you might want to, you know, just make sure you know what you're supposed to be doing before you uh, decide to, to take matters into your own hands. So I want to ask you also about the cost of these tests. Right. So um, if, you said if you can get one. So I assume there's not it's hard to get. Yes. Yes. But I saw like, for example, I just looked it up on online and I can get two, I can spend twenty four dollars for two of them at CVS. Right. For the two pack, which is not cheap. Uh, I understand that, for example, in Germany, it costs a dollar. In the UK, they'll give you 14 tests for free. That feels expensive to me yes. for most people. So talk me through that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're less expensive than many other kinds of tests. Um, but uh, yes, they're, they're not the kind of thing that you can use on a daily basis. And, um, you know, maybe if you're, you're especially concerned, like, is, the, is my child um, infected with COVID or is this seasonal allergies, you know, a one time or a couple of time use, that's, that's uh, more doable for that price point, but it's not an everyday sort of thing. That's for sure. And, and so um, under the president's plan, he's asked manufacturers to sell the tests at cost which will bring it down further, but it's not going to get to $1 or $0 without federal support. And, and so that's, um, that's the policy issue at, um, in question right now. And um, will, will people use them to be able to help uh, curb the, the pandemic? Um, that's, uh, it would be nice to have more data on, on the use scenarios like, like we've seen in the UK. So like how, how effective are, are, is that, um, are the free tests, you know, in, in actually 
making a change in public health. I um, would like to see uh, more places use rapid tests. So, um, you know, if there's the whole verification um, aspect of testing. So like, I could take a test, I could tell you what the results were, but you know, how do you know that I'm telling the truth? And for, for a concert venue or some sort of like office visit, um, you know, being able to perform that test right on the spot would be, would be a useful thing to do. But, um, you know, is there a market for that? So I think, I think there's going to be a, a lot of flux in the testing market. We are trying to track this and give more information as it, as it comes out about the, the new tests um, on our COVID-19 testing toolkit. Um, but it's, you know, it's not, uh, it's, it's not a simple thing. And especially because there's so many different kinds of tests. I mean, ideally, would you have people testing themselves every morning? So that is um, that is the vision that some people have. That you know, if you're if you um, test positive, then you know that you have a lot of virus, um, and you should not be around other people. Um, other ways to use these tests are, say, you have a child who has been informed that that their classmate did have COVID and, and so they're a close contact. Now they're kicked into quarantine for 10 days and can't be in school learning. So some school districts have instituted a test to stay protocol. So everybody who is a close contact will get tested every day to see if they turn positive. And as long as they're negative, they're allowed to stay in person. That could be fantastic. Um, it just has to be accompanied by all the other stuff that schools should be doing in addition to testing, like you know, masks and ventilation improvements and things like that. Mm -hmm. I've already gotten a few letters from my kids' high schools saying, um, you're not a close contact, but there's another case. And so that kind of stuff worries me, you know, and I, and in fact, my daughter told me that a friend of hers uh, that she runs cross country with is one of the people. And they told me she's not a, a close contact. So I sort of wonder the validity of, of that as well. I agree. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, especially when it comes to close contact in, uh, in a classroom, um, it really depends on what the ventilation situation is and, you know, how much, uh, people would, should be considered a close contact in my opinion. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, it will be better for everyone. Um, when, when everybody is vaccinated. Indeed. Um, Quickly, I'd like to know what you sort of see as the future, the next few months when it comes to testing, what we're going to see. Yeah, so I think there's going to be some big changes in the market. So um, a couple of the manufacturers of the rapid at-home tests, they didn't see a future prior to the Delta variant. And um, Abbott has gotten a lot of criticism because they destroyed a lot of their tests. So they are not available. And a lot of people, even though there's no central place where you can say, um, you know, what's the testing availability in uh, Walgreens or CVSs across the country? I, nobody has that information besides the companies themselves. But, you know, it's uh, a lot of, there's a lot of anecdotal reports that, that people are having a hard time finding these rapid at-home tests. So there appears to be a shortage. Hopefully the manufacturers will step it up. Um, there are additional manufacturers that have um, their data submitted to FDA. Perhaps we will see some more emergency use authorization of um, additional rapid tests. So that's something that'll change. I think um, testing is going to be increasingly used as kind of a passport of sorts. And, and so there's going to be a lot of more money in that. And that comes with a lot of uh, complications for the future. People are going to need verified tests for travel, for attending concerts, for doing the things that they want to do. And uh, they're, they're going to have to have those results within a certain period of time before the event. And so that that kind of commodity is uh, is there might be some issues down the road when it comes to competition and uh, the amount of, of cost that it would be to get that test result in the time that you need it. So I see those two things as being really um, driving the market for testing. But I hope 
that some of the emphasis on school testing will lead to some bigger improvements, I hope, in the future. I'd like to see uh, testing for other diseases as well, and um, including for flu and for RSV, and even you know for surveillance when it comes to other kinds of diseases that might um, afflict kids. And I, I think uh, we have an opportunity to kind of um, build on what we've done here with school-based testing to make people safer and healthier in the future. Gigi Granval, thanks so much for joining. Thank you. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharpstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, CN Oates, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outlin. Social media support from Brenda Hagater, Grace Holes-Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.